Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this press conference from the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in snowy Davos. Uh, welcome here in the room, welcome on the live stream, and a warm welcome to our wonderful panelists here today. I think every Davos, um, even though my colleagues might hope uh, otherwise, will be remembered for two or three strong messages coming, coming out from, from here, from the week here in the mountains, in the Swiss mountains. And last year that was for sure the fourth industrial revolution, but it was also a report that was launched by the Alan MacArthur Foundation. Um, and the, the tagline that really was, was picked up by media a lot and discussed on social media was, if we don't change our ways by 2030, we will have more plastic than fish in the ocean. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that we can actually come back to that uh, very important topic with this press conference today, which is dedicated to the question, again, more plastics in the ocean than fish, but we're looking forward and asking, what's the solution? And uh, to answer that, uh, we have a wonderful panel here uh, today. Let me quickly introduce uh, my fellow panelists to my immediate left, we're joined by Andrew Morlet, the Chief Executive Officer of the Alan MacArthur Foundation uh, based in the United Kingdom. Um, right in the center of our panel, we're joined by Virginie Elias, the Global Sustainability Director of Procter & Gamble. Next to her, we're joined by Tom Zaki, who's the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of TerraCycle. He's also a Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneur of the Forum, so uh, part of a very interesting community there. And last but not least, um, we are joined by Jean-Marc Bourzier, the Group Senior Executive Vice President for Recycling and Waste Recovery of Suez. Um, the organizations of my panelists already give a little bit away um, what we will announce today, uh, but let me first uh, give the floor to, to Andrew and give us an update, please, Andrew, on the work of the Alan MacArthur Foundation. I know you've been working on the issue continuously over the year. Maybe you can give us some updates there, please. Thank you. Yes, um, as you mentioned, last year we released the New Plastics Economy a report, which was really about rethinking uh, plastics packaging globally. And what we showed in that report, really, for the first time, is that globally, uh, despite 40 years of effort uh, to focus on recycling, we currently only collect 14% of plastics for recycling, and we lose a significant amount of that through the recycling process. So only 2% of that goes back into the value chain uh, for reuse um, to date. And at the same time, we also have roughly one third of all global plastics packaging uh, leaking into the natural environment. So as mentioned, by 2030, we, will, we are on track, 2050 in fact, we will are on track to have more, ocean, uh, more plastics in the ocean than fish by weight. Uh, what we've done since uh, that release of the report is to launch an initiative to implement the findings of the report. Uh, we have been supported very strongly by a group of philanthropic organisations and a number of uh, corporate partners uh, to put in place an implementation uh, initiative called the New Plastics Economy Initiative. Uh, we have a set of core corporate partners including Amcor, Coca-Cola, Danone, Mars, Novamont, Unilever and Veolia an additional 40 companies across the, uh, the value chain from polymers, packaging manufacturers, brands, cities, governments and uh, collecting, sorting and reprocessing companies. Uh, what we've also done is uh, a, a significant amount of additional analysis on this uh, topic and this week we've released a, a follow-up report and we've in that plan uh, outlined a very clear, in, in that report we've outlined a very clear plan uh, for starting to shift the system towards uh, a much better outcome. Uh, and we have uh, managed to get the endorsement of 40 CEOs and senior executives uh, for that plan and it clearly outlines uh, a, a pathway forward that will allow us to shift from that 14% number I mentioned earlier to a 70% recycling uh, of the plastics packaging as we see it today. The further 30% that isn't in that group needs to be fundamentally redesigned. To date, it's not economic to collect, sort, or reprocess, and we've launched an additional initiative focused on innovation in that 30%, uh, which we will be uh, launching uh, and announcing during the year for a series of global challenges and innovation initiatives. Um, today, we're joined here, uh, as mentioned, by Procter Gamble, uh, Sewers, and uh, TerraCycle, who are all part of the New Plastics Economy Initiative, and uh, we've got a, a discussion that they're going to uh, carry on, which is really about an initiative that is essentially complementary to the new Plastics Econom Economy Initiative, uh, really reinforcing 
the importance of uh, recycling and raising the awareness of the issue of uh, plastics uh, in the ocean. Uh, ultimately, we need to move upstream. We need to stop plastics getting in the ocean uh, uh, from the get-go, and that's what the New Plastics Economy Initiative is, is focused on. And I'll pass across, I think, to have a discussion. Th thank you, yeah. thank you, Andrew. Uh, Virginie, um, you obviously listened quite carefully last year to the report that was launched here, um, because as uh, in the discussions we had in the run-up to Davos, I learned that uh, this this report really uh, kind of kicked off a process at at PNG. Uh, please share with us um, what uh, where do we stand now in this process, and what uh, what can you announce today? Yes, absolutely, it has been great inspiration for us. So, PNG serves nearly five billion people around the world, and we see it as our responsibility um, to create a world where seven, nine million people can um, live well within the boundaries of the planet. So PNG is rising to the challenge of sustainable consumption and the circular economy, and let me tell you how. So first, we are announcing that through Head & Shoulders, the world number one shampoo brand, we will create the world's first recyclable shampoo bottle made with beach plastic. So this is a first for the hair care industry, and it will come to France this summer in a limited edition in the Carrefour outlet. And thanks to the partnership with uh, TerraCycle and Suez, we are able to make the largest production run of its kind, and a first step in, in establishing um, a very unique uh, supply chain, so they will tell you more about that. But for now, let me show you the bottle. So this is the bottle. As you can see, or as you will see, we are making it very clear that it is made from recycled plastic from the beach. And this is really to let people know that they can be part of the solution by purchasing head and shoulders. And secondly, we are very proud to announce today that more than half a billion bottles each year will include up to 25% post-consumer recycled plastic by the end of 2018. This represents about uh, more than 90% of all the bottles that we sell in Europe across our hair care portfolio beyond brands like Head & Shoulders, but also Pantene. And just to give you um, an idea of the scale, this will require 2,600 metric tons of post-consumer recycled plastic. Imagine the weight of um, eight fully loaded 747 jumbo jets. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Tom. You'll, you'll forgive me if I say you look a little bit like the ancient Greek of Poseidon just, just coming from the ocean. <laughs> so um, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, where this plastic comes from in more detail because you'll, your role in this uh, partnership, I understand, is, uh, is uh, in part the collection of the, of, of the plastics. So um, I, I see you've also brought us some, uh, something. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to my colleagues on, on the panel. First, I just want to echo uh, that it's because of groups like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that put out challenges uh, uh, and also explain how we have to look at this in a completely multi-stakeholder fashion that world's first and really meaningful projects like this can exist. Um, TerraCycle uh, uh, is a, a younger company uh, and uh, we operate all over the world trying to make things that are non-recyclable recyclable. And I think it's important to take a step back and just think about, as uh, my colleague from the Ellen, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation said, there's a huge challenge today in plastics in that very little today is actually recovered and recycled. And if you think about the ocean uh, and marine uh, plastic, 25% of all the plastic today that is consumed ends up in the marine systems. That could be in rivers, lakes, oceans, and then eventually washed up on beaches and so on. The material looks like this. This is literally uh, examples of uh, what goes into this world's first shampoo bottle uh, that we see. So in fact, this turns into this. Now, how does that all come together? Uh, TerraCycle, uh, across Europe, uh, has engaged with hundreds of various nonprofit organizations and other groups who clean up waterways, uh, like rivers, beaches, oceans, harbors, lakes, and so on. 
all this material, uh, instead of now being thrown out, uh, is being collected by TerraCycle, uh, and through our collaboration with Suez and some in quite incredible science, we're able to take this completely mixed material and turn it into a very high performance uh, polymer uh, that can then be introduced at 25% into a bottle like this. Now this may seem simple on the surface, but making a bottle that can be squeezed, uh, something that can really last on shelf and be something that the world's most important shampoo brand can be proud of, is actually quite a tremendous amount of science involved. The exciting thing here is that this project is something that is really just the very beginning of where this entire uh, uh, beach plastic initiative will go. And I think that it's also something that while there are some large organizations that made it happen at this scale, and really the largest scale the world has ever seen in the world of uh, marine plastics, is that consumers can be very directly involved. Consumers can help support the pr uh, project by supporting products like this that do big steps in the right direction. But they can also go further. This is the first shampoo bottle uh, uh, made from beach plastic that can then be locally recycled in your local recycling system. So consumers can also be a part of it by then making sure this doesn't end up as litter or anywhere else and can be recycled to go around yet again. And I think there's a third part that's very exciting is consumers can be involved by joining their local cleanup efforts and helping to actually make more of these bottles. Uh, and when can you actually be involved in the supply chain like that? And the final thing I want to say that's really inspiring to me is if you are a head and shoulders consumer, you probably know that the normal bottle is bright white. And uh, usually uh, uh, companies uh, uh, are a little conservative uh, when using recycled materials to move away from iconic colors. And as you can see here, what makes me really proud of the fact that this bottle is a gray color is that here Procter & Gamble has chosen to not resist the differences in, in, uh, in recycled materials, but in fact embrace it and be tremendously proud of it. And that is actually a very brave and uh, a very big thing to do uh, that other companies have not done so far. So I hope that this not only is something that we can do together here, but inspires other organizations to take up the, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the new plastic economy work that the Alan MacArthur Foundation has put forward and make steps like this. Uh, because that's the only way that we can really wake up uh, in a world where we are not going to be suffocating the fish and all the marine life with the plastic we choose to put into our oceans and waterways. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jean-Marc, let's move further down the panel, but also down the, the value chain. Um, Suez is the recycling company, so once Tom has done his work, um, you come into play. Please share with us what's your role in this partnership. Yes, exactly, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be uh, with you today and to be with uh, Procter & Gamble and uh, with TerraCycle for this uh, new event. Uh, as you know, Suez is ready for the, the resource revolution. We don't believe waste. This is the end of the world and we are there to turn waste into secondary raw material or energy. Uh, in this uh, particular case, we are not only protecting the environment, this is our duty as an environmental company, but we are also there to turn waste into a, a new product. We have uh, invested long ago into the plastic recovery within uh, Suez. Uh, we've got uh, nine dedicated units, and we are able to collect, to sort, 350,000 tons of plastic and to recycle that into high quality polymer. And now we are able to produce secondary polymer which have the same value, the same quality as Virgin One with the comparable prices, which is uh, an innovation. Uh, we are specialized in uh, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, PET and polypropylene. And in this case, we are turning beach plastic, as you have seen with the uh, Tom, into high quality polyethylene. Uh, once the, the plastic has been uh, collected by uh, TerraCycle, we are shredding it, we are washing it, we are uh, making flakes, and then we are making granulates through a, a technical and chemical product called extrusion, and we are turning that into granulate that will become a bottle. And all of that will be done in our most modern unit called QCP for quality circular polymer in uh, Maastricht in uh, the Netherlands. So we are very proud of it. This is the beginning of an adventure. As you have listened from Tom and from Virginie, uh, the commitment of, uh, of uh, uh, Procter & Gamble in this case is very clear. We are going progressively to increase the quantity of recycled plastic that will be used in uh, not only uh, shampoo bottles, but on all type of packaging. We have now all the technical expertise within Suez to make it possible. So this is the beginning of a new area, and we are very proud to be part of it. Thank you, thank you. Tom, let me get back to you. Um, maybe explain for our viewers online 
how exactly does the collection take place? Because we're talking about a huge number, uh, and, and uh, Virginie mentioned the, the, the metric tons here. So how, do, how does it, what, what does actually happen there? Yes, absolutely. So the way this comes to life uh, is uh, uh, people out there, uh, various organizations, uh, 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 folks who are cleaning up beaches and waterways, are going out there and cleaning up all this material from uh, our water systems that are washing up on, uh, uh, on beaches and riverfronts and so on. It's an incredibly cumbersome process because you're taking pieces, it's really a litter prevention uh, exercise, and then when these volumes are uh, uh, collected, all this garbage is uh, collected, uh, TerraCycle at no cost picks it up uh, from all these locations across Europe. Uh, it goes to uh, uh, regional uh, warehouses of ours, where from there, once it's all been collected and put together, uh, we do some manual sortation. Because you can imagine something that's been floating uh, in the ocean and then later washed up on the beach will be covered with uh, seaweed. There'll be all sorts of uh, strange things uh, uh, that make it actually the real reason that ocean plastics are not just a problem. Let's be clear, it's a tremendous crisis of how much uh, uh, material is out there. And then from there, after uh, uh, we receive it and we've sorted out uh, uh, these contaminants, uh, as uh, Jean-Marc said, it gets shredded, and then we clean off other things that may be there, like uh, 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 microbes, um, uh, sand, and so on. The, the, a large percentage of what we collect, about over 50% of all this material, uh, is HDPE, because HDPE, which is what makes up this bottle, actually floats. So it's, uh, that's why it comes out in a relatively high percentage. But another very exciting thing I want to mention is Almost half of the material is different types of plastic. And this is where uh, I'm really uh, excited about the partnership with PNG and Suez, is that all that other material is also going to be recycled into other things, like plastic benches and uh, picnic tables that will then be donated back to uh, shoreline communities. So 100% everything that is being collected is now not ending up uh, in disposal systems or as litter, uh, but is now being made into uh, this bottle and then other things uh, that will help uh, complete uh, the recycling loop. And I just want to say to anyone watching today, when you do find this bottle uh, uh, on your shelves and hopefully uh, you choose to support the product, please make sure to recycle it uh, because it's one of the exciting things um, about waste. I mean, waste is a generally horrendous thing. But luckily, it's one of these environmental topics that we as consumers can do something about. We can do something by supporting the products that uh, are made out of recycled material and can be recycled and not supporting the ones that are not. And we can then do our part by recycling it. Other environmental issues are much harder for individuals to play a very big part. And I can say if we do this, then major organizations like PNG, but many others who are not at this table today, will listen and will change their, their process to echo what consumers want. But inversely, if as consumers we shop blindly, that's like going to the voting poll every four years and voting without even looking at who's on the ballot. And we know what happens when we make poor voting choices. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That went, uh, that went uh, not just to the beach, but over the ocean, I guess. But uh, Virginie, let me come back to you. Um, Tom mentioned that it's quite uncommon uh, for a company to uh, accept the, the gray color here because it, uh, I mean, I, when I wash my hair in the morning, I still have my eyes closed, but I, I do see his point that a white bottle is more attractive for hair care and a beauty product. So what in the hell made you uh, accept the gray bottle? Well, it's very important for us to create the awareness. So, so this color shows that something is different and make people, um, it has a lot of stopping power, you know, in the, in the store, so it will make people um, stop and, and ask, what is that about? And, and actually on the bottle, on the front of the bottle, on the back of the bottle, there are many explanations. They can actually go back to the website and have the story behind it. So we'll, and, and you have also the type of item that has been collected, you know, in, in, in the logo here. So it's, um, it's really uh, to raise consumer awareness so that as Tom was saying, they get inspired to do more and they get inspired, so they first do their bit by purchasing the bottle, and then they do their bit by recycling it, and they learn more about it. So it's re really a way to um, uh, highlight the opportunity that we have on our recycling system, which is today not optimal, and uh, making sure that uh, consumers can be, uh, do their part in the whole system. Thank you very much. Andrew, um, when you launched the first report last year, um, it was, like so many things in 2016, not very upbeat. Um, now, if you hear of this partnership, um, are you more optimistic than you were a year ago that we can, uh, with the new plastics economy, solve or find a solution for this, for this challenge? Well, I, th I think that um, uh, the report that came out last year was fairly groundbreaking because it, for the first time, uh, gave a view of the 
flows of, of plastics globally and the extent of the leakage of the system today. Um, as I mentioned in the opening comments, I think that initiatives like this are, are really very important in raising awareness and I think that the, uh, the, the consumer's understanding of the magnitude of the challenge uh, is important. But ultimately, um, these types of initiatives are end of pipe initiatives. They're treating the symptom, not the cause. And New Plastics Economy's aim is really to uh, uh, fundamentally uh, address the cause of, of the issue and to uh, redesign and rethink packaging, so move to much more towards reuse, move much more to taking the fractions of plastics out that will never be recyclable out of the system. And what, what is really encouraging, I think, over the last year is we've seen a tremendous engagement of, of, of companies and organisations around this topic, governments and cities, really working together to understand how do we find ways of addressing the root cause. And um, what we can see is that uh, we've got other initiatives out there. Unilever announced the other day that they are shifting to 100% recyclable packaging by 2025, which is a very fundamental upstream redesign uh, agenda. And, it, and these are quite complementary because we need multiple company initiatives, we need multiple, uh, multiple uh, platforms working on this. Uh, we're releasing tomorrow a circular design guide with IDEO, which is aimed to help the design community understand the issue much more uh, in much more detail so they can participate in the redesign of plastics packaging solutions. So whether it is uh, reusable cartridges or the use of materials that are much more valuable at the end of use so they will be collected and they will be able to be uh, sorted and recycled at much, much higher rates. And, and the level of engagement and the fact that we've got the uh, endorsement of the uh, 40 plus CEOs and, and executives to this agenda, I think is hugely encouraging. And I think we're going to see over the course of this year with the Innovation Challenge launches and other companies coming forward, many, many organisations starting to move much more upstream to address this root cause problem. So a lot of great uh, cause for optimism there. Well, I think so. And it's a, we, look, we like to characterise this is, as an opportunity because what we're seeing is that the rethinking of packaging uh, to meet customers' uh, needs better to think about, you know, reuse of uh, packages and, and the concentrates that you can drop into a package, making it easier for customers to shop and to carry things home. Uh, we get not only benefits in terms of plastics reuse, but the carbon miles, the energy, et cetera, the water reduction. So all of these things, I think, are coming together and we're, we're learning collectively that this is a systems challenge, not an individual company product change challenge. Mm. And, and I think that learning is um, uh, growing very rapidly and, and I think there's a lot of cause for encouragement, actually. Great, thank you, Andrew. Jean-Marc, I think you wanted to, to add to that one. Yes, Please. I would like to, to rebound on the comment of Andrew and I would like uh, sincerely to thank uh, Andrew for his hard work and I would like to thank the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation because uh, you have been really uh, inspirational over the last few years in creating this new plastic economy. Uh, as you know, within Suez, we are totally convinced, I am convinced that the fourth industrial revolution will not only be digital, but it will also be around the resource and the reutilization of, uh, of goods. Um, uh, the European Commission is also totally convinced about it because, as you know, in the new uh, economy package, we have an objective which is to recycle 75% of all packaging, including the plastic one, by 2030 uh, versus around 50% today. So there is a huge gap that altogether we need to go over. Uh, there are very clear push measures. The question was around are, are there uh, sufficient demands uh, in order for us in Europe mm -hmm. to reutilize all those uh, plastic mm -hmm. uh, and to create jobs and to protect the environment. I just would like to give you an additional uh, one or two figures. Each time we are recycling one ton of plastic, we are saving five barrels of, of oil, mm -hmm. which is very significant. And in order to pr produce those plastic, we are using 90% less energy than to produce virgin ones. A final number, and I will stop with that. Each time we are producing one ton, we are saving 1.6 ton of CO2. Mm -hmm. So it's good for the environment, it's good for the protection of the environment, it's good for the business. We are going to create jobs so the question was, is there sufficient demand? And the fact that we are all here today means that big names like Procter & Gamble are taking significant step forward. And like Andrew, I am very positive for the future indeed. Jean-Marc, um, let me follow up on that. Um, 
you mentioned the role of the European Commission. Um, usually business leaders come to Davos and they have one or two uh, demands or wishes for the assembled public sector representatives here. And the forum is a platform for public-private sector uh, um, collaboration. So maybe you, but also Virginie, uh, to you, what are the things that you're missing from uh, from the public sector, from governments that could support or make it easier for these for these projects? Anything you have on your mind that keeps you up at night? Uh, there are a few of what we call pull measures that we need to adopt very rapidly in order to ease this uh, secondary resource uh, market. Uh, the first one is uh, a clear labeling. We need to know if I am an individual, if I am a consumer, I want to know whether or not my packaging is not only recyclable, but effectively recycled. And the fact that PNG is so proud in showing that uh, this comes from plastic beach might help me deciding I want to use this product because as an individual, I want to be part of it and I want to protect the environment. The second topic is around the uh, uh, green public procurement. Local governments and central governments, they need to push for measures in order for them also to promote secondary uh, reuse of material. The third is around the uh, VAT. We are pushing very hard in the various states to have uh, reduced VAT. Uh, clearly, uh, this product was already put on the market, so the, it has already supported the VAT. So why should we have a second VAT each time there is uh, the reuse? And we need to, uh, if we were able to reduce a little bit the cost of those uh, packaging, obviously that would ease uh, the consumer to, to elect for those type of products. And finally, uh, you want to, no, you want to add something? No, no, please, go ahead, finish. Uh, I, I, I forgot the last measure. It will, it will oh, come I, will, I will just uh, build and amplify on what Jean-Marc is saying, is that today, if you, outside what you're seeing here, the, in the normal situation when consumer product companies are looking to acquire just even, not even uh, uh, beach and marine plastic, uh, uh, but just normal recycled content, the biggest reason they don't buy and why a lot of our products are not today made from recycled content, let alone a high percentage of recycled content, is because generally recycled material may have potentially a higher price, although you know, we've heard from our colleagues at Suez that that is now being solved, but historically that's been an issue. And the quality, uh, which could be many things, but it's easy to uh, understand that in an example of color, it's very hard, for example, to have clear or white recycled materials, why this bottle comes out a little bit different in color. Those have been reasons to say no. And from an EU uh, a Commission point of view, and I think this is a global answer, not just a European one, um, it's really important to create levers uh, to be able to make it easier for organizations uh, who may not be as brave as the example you see here today to be able to easily procure these materials, uh, which means perhaps hired, uh, uh, you know, some sort of disincentive on virgin materials and some sort of incentive on recycled materials. Uh, 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 that is critically important, especially because today oil prices are low, which makes it even harder for recycled materials to compete one-to-one -one against uh, virgin materials. Outside that, because that's not going to happen tomorrow, and in uh, uh, places like the United States, it's very unlikely for these legislations to happen, at least in the next four years. It's, uh, uh, it, what is needed is organizations to see uh, uh, these case studies, like what you see today with P&G and the Head and Shoulders brand, and to emulate that, replicate it. And I think as you see that, that creates competitive momentum in the exact right direction. And uh, the message is to people watching, as, as consumers, make sure to voice your opinion by being a part of this. Uh, that's not just sharing what you see, but it's also actively engaging, uh, uh, which is supporting products uh, 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 that do the right thing, and then being even more involved by recycling them, and in this particular case, help us build the next production run of this by going to your local area and participating in a, in a beach cleanup uh, or a riverway cleanup. Thank you very much. Jean-Marc, you yes, remember the, the fourth the point? The, the next political debate that we need to have collectively is around the price for carbon. Uh, at uh, six to seven euro per, per ton, uh, it's not so, so uh, not so sufficient to uh, to promote uh, objectively uh, uh, recycled material versus virgin one. In the case of P and PP, we are able to produce good quality polymer at a lower cost than the virgin one. But for other polymers like PET, the comparison is still difficult. So we believe that uh, we need to. Uh, include all the environmental externalities in the comparison between virgin and, uh, and, uh, and recycled, and with a price of carbon around 30 euro, that would make the difference. So we are at the beginning of an area, and I totally share the comment of Tom, this is up to the consumers, the citizens, to decide whether or not they have to go, or they would like to go for uh, recycling. There are two moments in your, in, your, uh, in your day where you can decide to go for recycling. First, when you buy those products, so I recommend that you, you look carefully at the labeling and you decide to go for recycling. And second, when you sort at the end of your consumption.
So this is the right time, but we need you to promote a new era for the future. Thank you. Can I just add to that? I think that, that, that there is certainly a role of the public in this topic, but I think that ultimately this is an industrial design challenge. And this is uh, a challenge that the companies uh, need to take on board. It's an opportunity for innovating towards a different system. And, and that is what will ultimately stop plastics getting into the ocean or into the natural environment, will improve the economics of plastics post-use. Today, there are no global standards for plastics. So anybody can produce any plastics in any format anywhere in the world, which results in a highly complex, fragmented um, mix of plastics post-use, which make it very difficult to get good quality plastics at an economic rate. So the new plastics economy work is really driving to this idea of how do we converge industrially to a smaller number of plastics, a, a number of common standards and formats, which shift the economics that make the collect, sort and reprocessing much more viable and prevent plastics from leaking into the ocean in the first place. We will not, we will not solve the plastics challenge, we will not solve it by beach collections alone. We have to have the industry innovation and the, uh, the, the redesign of the system collectively in order to do that. And I think it's really important to keep this in context that this is a, this is a very important thing for people to understand that it's not the public's job to fix this issue. It's not up to customers to, uh, to fix the, 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 the industrial design challenge. It's got to be done collectively. Customers have an important role to play in, in, in acting in a system that they can work within, but it's really the industrial collaboration across companies with governments and cities, from polymers, packaging manufacturers, brands, cities, collect, sort and reprocessing, to find a converging model that improves the economics to prevent plastics getting into the ocean in the first instance. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the room? Um, if I don't see a show of hands, um, Virginie, I'd like to ask you, um, uh, before we close, like a double question. Number one is, what's the biggest challenge, challenge you haven't solved yet in this, in this process? And number two, kind of, uh, what's, what's the biggest learning for you uh, personally as well as a professional in that field from that process? The biggest challenge actually is how do you uh, drive this to scale and how do you drive the, you know, the systemic change? And I think I totally agree that it starts upstream with the design and we are working on this. I mean, our vision is zero waste to landfill which means first use less material, then you know, uh, use more uh, plastic, recycled plastic, uh, and make it recyclable. But it, it, there is a great role in, in upstream. But then you know, it's uh, the four vectors where we are very engaged, not alone, because we can't be engaged alone on this. It's one, access to collection. I mean, we work with municipality on this. Then in inspiring consumer, to make, uh, to recycle, to make it desirable, easy, and rewarding, so that it becomes autopilot. Uh, third is investing in the sorting technology, and, and we have a project with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on, on tracer-based sorting, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is creating a market, and that's exactly what it does. And so I think when people understand that uh, uh, driving systemic change through those four things, I mean, it can make a significant uh, difference. And then um, your second question was, what What's your biggest learning from this process? Biggest learning, it's really, uh, it all starts with conviction, inspiration, and conviction. And I think the example of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation report that says, you know, if we do nothing, it's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean was so simple and so striking that I can tell you internally, it has uh, triggered something very strong. And then it's, okay, how, how can I make a difference? And, and you can make a difference just starting with the beach plastic. Just a start, but it capture the, you know, it, it moves from conviction to action. And, and we believe in, in small but meaningful step. You know, if everybody in on, on our, all our businesses or 10 categories does something like that, you know, cumulatively, we can make a huge difference. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for being here. And a special thank you to all my panelists today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.